Great. Uh, so I'm Brian Infinite at CTO. Uh, welcome to Boston. Yeah, so uh, we made good use of your uh, weather delay. And uh, basically, we worked to replace all the technical <coughs> content in the presentation, just buzzwords and just complete marketing nonsense. Perfect. Great. So I, th Goody. So I Great. think you guys are actually really going to like it. Um, and cat video. I look forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, in my team's never ending quest to embarrass me, they actually provided some suggested um, like openers. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it, and you guys tell me what you think. Um, Fasten your seatbelts, delegates, because Infinidat self-driving storage is going to accelerate your personal journey to the cloud. Mm. Nah. Nah. Uh, nah. Next. Uh, so much. It's resonating. Some of these, I, I don't even. <laughs> oh, I, I don't even know what's real anymore. Is composable infrastructure a real thing? There's a company that's. Yes. yes. More than one. Many. So are these IT systems that you buy at IKEA and assemble at home? <laughs> More or less. Brian? Yes. No? Don't okay. quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there actually is one real one hidden in here, uh, which is data is the new oil. And this one's been floating around. It kind of, it started with a headline in The Economist. And it kind of, spread around, and I, I think it's kind of a good place to start, a, uh, to start a discussion about information storage. And so what I'd like to do is actually start by telling you guys a customer story. So this story is about data, and it's about oil. But it's mostly about water. You guys probably know that South Africa right now is in the midst of a once in a century water shortage. <laughs> so by the most conservative est estimates, South Africa is looking at a billion cubic meter a year deficit in their water supply. And the you know to to you know to to react to this Cape Town has implemented a 50 liter per day per household rationing of water. Now to put this in context, here in Massachusetts in 2013, which is the best, the latest data we have, the average household water consumption was 973 liters. To put that in perspective how serious this is. And Cape Town is, their municipal water supply company, is forecasting what they call day zero, where they shut down the municipal water supply when it runs dry, is a little more than a year away from right now. So all told, this is a potentially huge humanitarian crisis that we're dealing with. It's 60 million citizens that are at risk. So what are we going to do about it? Conventional wisdom says that you build more of these. When you don't have enough water, the solution is to make more water. And so there are intense efforts going right now. The Israelis who kind of dealt with this about a decade ago are helping the South Africans build desalination plants. Somebody said, somebody. The problem with desalination is that separating salt from water requires enormous amounts of energy. So basically, every time you do this, Every time you build one of these, you also have to build a power plant. And because the, you know, the renewables, just the technology isn't ready yet. So whether we like it or not, the way that you solve this is you have to burn hydrocarbons. And that introduces another dimension because burning hydrocarbons releases carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, which wow. almost certainly are contributing to the climate change which got us in this, in this problem in the first place. Even if we tap out the maximum uh, capacity, it's still a drop in the bucket. The desalination plants can maybe add and fix 2% of the <laughs> deficit. So clearly, conventional wisdom is not going to solve this crisis. The way that we are going to solve this crisis is with unconventional wisdom. 
And unconventional wisdom says, rather than trying to make more water, what you do is you make water more efficient. So 60% of South Africa's water supply is used for agriculture. And so if you do the math out, if we can increase farming efficiency, the efficient use of water in the agriculture sector by 20%, we can make this water crisis go away. And here's how we're going to do that. So we have an amazing customer called Senves. They are a 100-year-old agricultural services South African company. And they are rolling out an intensive precision agriculture program. So what precision agriculture does is it uses drones and infrared imaging and computer vision and machine learning and huge amounts of data to identify precisely the areas in a field where water needs to be applied and then to take all that sensor data and steer precision amounts of fertilizer and water directly to the locations that need it. And the initial results are amazing. 20 to 40% reductions in both water and fertilizer usage with no impact on crop yields. In fact, in many cases, the crop yields actually increase. So I love this story because I think the timing of it is really important. Because there's a very serious dialogue going on right now in our industry about fundamentally about whether tech is still a force for good in humanity. And there's like an entire new generation of young makers and young engineers who are coming out of university. And they're looking at the, what they think the state of tech is. They're seeing cell phone addiction and surveillance capitalism and, uh, and social media uh, destruction. And they're questioning whether their engineering talents should be applied to go work on this. And you know, so I think Senves and it doesn't have to just be precision agriculture. It can be in precision medicine. You talked about Sheba Medicine in Israel using our technology to detect cancer uh, for cybersecurity threats. For there is, there are 60 million people, let's just say, in South Africa who would disagree with that argument about whether tech can still be a force for good in the universe. Um, and there's another thing that's important here, and let's get it back to kind of why we are all in the room right now. Think about the scale and the scope of big data. So when we were getting Infinidat off the ground, I can't tell you how many interviews I had with brilliant engineers and brilliant people who wanted to join, who all told me the same thing. They said, there are at most 50 customers for your product in the world because they're so ridiculously large. Maybe we'll sell a couple to a couple of phone companies, uh, maybe a couple of banks. And here we are, five or six years later, and we have farmers in South Africa who are operating with larger data sets than most banks in New York had a decade ago. And this is the fundamental nature of these types of nonlinear problems, like storage, that they are always growing, and they get big really, really fast. And the last thing that I'll leave with before we, we get into the, into the tech stuff here is about getting back to that concept of conventional wisdom. We believe that when the problem you're trying to solve is within an order of magnitude of your starting state, conventional wisdom is almost always right. It's exactly the, the right path forward to, uh, to get to your solution. But for nonlinear problems where the end state that you're trying to get to is orders of magnitude away from where the current state of the art is, conventional wisdom is almost always completely wrong. So what is conventional wisdom in the information storage enterprise 
industry right now. So I would argue that this kind of captures conventional wisdom in the industry right now. I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, but just tell me, give me a nod. Does this look familiar? You're missing MEMU over fabric. <laughs> <laughs> not right? quite conventional wisdom yet. So oh. I copied this. I stole this from a competitor. I took their logo off. Um, and it doesn't even matter who the competitor is because the stories are pretty much. No, that's table stakes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I want to be very clear, for terabyte scale computing, this is absolutely the way you do it. It is a solved problem. My boss has a slide that he loves to show customers. There's 110 all flash array companies. Maybe 109, we have to see what happens with Tintree today, but <laughs> we're, we're rooting for them. Let's be optimistic and say it's 110. Um, <clears throat> These companies are all using the same flash from the same fabs, They're using the same rate algorithms that are 40 years old. Um, I would point to the maturity of the terabyte scale computing uh, storage market to say that it is essentially a solved problem. But my postulate to you is that this does not work at multi-petabyte scale, if for no other reason than cost. So this is data from Gartner from April Ooh. that graphs the wholesale cost per gigabyte for orange storage or flash storage and green storage, which are nearline SAS disks. And basically what you see, and by the way, we picked Gartner data, but you can look at Trend Focus or you can look at IDC. I mean, this is pretty much consensus uh, supply chain information. That the differential <coughs> in cost per gigabyte going out to at least 2022, which is where Gartner forecast to, will maintain a 9x price gap. So to put it another way, both the cost of flash is decreasing exponentially. It's called Moore's Law, or it's a derivative of Moore's Law. Disk drive aerial density, and therefore, by proxy cost, is also decreasing exponentially. That's Kreider's Law. But the key insight that's getting missed by a lot of enterprise storage customers that are starting to have data sets that are large enough that they cannot ignore the media costs is that they are decreasing pretty much in parallel. And the, the differential is staying relatively flat around 9x. Our conclusion solely based on this data is the same thing that Silicon Valley figured out a decade ago when they were really the first industry as a whole where multi-petabyte computing became business as usual was the new normal. And now enterprises, now insurance companies and farmers are trying to figure this out for themselves as well. If you are building a storage system where cost is any part of the equation, it has to re involve disk. Now the problem is the disk is really cheap. The cost per gig is low. It's not going anywhere. Um, the forecast for 2018 is about $35 billion in, uh, in disk drive spend. And by the way, do you know who is driving that spend? Hyperscalers? It's all the hyperscalers. The roadmaps, the roadmaps for disk drives with Seagate and HGST and Western Digital is not being driven by enterprise companies. It's not a desktop thing. It's being driven by Google and Facebook who are telling them where they need to go. Conversely, who's controlling the table uh, for the supply chains for Flash? Apple not EMC. Samsung. <laughs> Absolutely. All manufacturers. Absolutely. ZTE. It's, uh, it's the, uh, the handset manufacturer. Although that's a lot less than it was. They're, they're down to just barely the majority of Flash. Right. SSDs have grown substantially as Flash components over the past couple of years. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they're part of the magic that makes Infinibox possible. But anyway, the takeaway from this is that if you're building a system in the next couple of years, that's big enough that you cannot ignore the cost, it has to involve disk. The problem is, 
Discs are cheap, they're reliable, they're not going anywhere, but they absolutely cannot do random I.O. They are bandwidth machines. And so that means if you look at some of the you know, innovative architectures that are coming out of the valley right now, if you look at the, um, the Bryce Canyon storage architecture from Facebook and kind of similar systems that are around within an order of magnitude the density of ours, you can't run databases and VMware and stuff like that on that. They're sequential reading and writing machines. So again, getting back to this theme of unconventional wisdom, we have to find another way to build storage systems if we're going to be big and we're going to be cheap. And so here's Infinidat's kind of basic fundamental premise, our technical idea. What if we said forget about hardware? Hardware innovation happens too slowly. The, the um, reliance on successive generations of hardware to drive your products forward is not cost effective. And what I mean by that is, you know, think back to the, you know, when 10,000 RPM drives were invented and they came to market and the salespeople came in to all the enterprise customers and said, we have this new thing, they're 10,000 RPM drives, they're really fast, move all your data onto them and your problems are gonna go away. Then five years later they come back and they say, there's these new things, they're called 15,000 RPM drives, move all your data onto it and your problems are gonna go away. Then fast forward a couple of years, there's these new things called SSDs, and they're a game changer. Move all your data onto them, and your problems are going to go away. And now, right now, these same people are meeting with enterprise customers saying, there's this new thing called NVMe, and just move all your data onto it, and all your problems are going to go away. Hardware innovation happens too slowly. It prevents you from taking advantage of those uh, exponentially decreasing costs. It keeps you always on the latest and greatest but it destroys any long-term cost advantage that you can have. So our fundamental technical idea is, what if we said that hardware didn't matter? And what if instead of thinking about storage systems as collections of hardware, we thought of storage systems as computer outputs? And what if we could use math to find a way to decouple the performance that applications see from where the data is actually living at rest, from the type of media. Because if there was a way to decouple that and to make it, to break with that you know, 40 or 50 years of, of tradition in the industry where the performance that an application sees is directly a result of whatever the media type, is it a 3390 drive, is it a 10,000 RPM open systems drive, is it flash, is it NVMe? If there was a way to decouple those two aspects, the performance application C from the type of media where the data is living at rest. It gives us an opportunity to completely change the paradigm, to use a doc word, completely change the paradigm and get off this hamster wheel of always being forced to be on the most expensive media that money can buy. This is a potential solution that allows us to build systems that are massively large but are not overwhelmingly expensive. So fundamentally, this is the idea behind InfiniBox. So let's, let me unpack this for you guys and talk a little bit about how we build these boxes. So the first thing that we do in order to have our storage systems behave the way we want is we break every incoming workload into billions of little 64 kilobyte objects that we call sections. And this happens all the way at the top of our architecture uh, at a layer that we call the port drivers. So we have port drivers for Fiber Channel and iSCSI and uh, an NFS. We have more that are coming. And one of the jobs of the port driver is to decompose or to break any type of incoming stream into billions of little 64 kilobyte objects. And the reason we do this is to make any type of incoming workload a massively parallel problem. Because this allows us to have a large number of CPU cores that are analyzing the relationships between the sections. It allows us to interleave that, uh, those data streams between a large number of uh, 
DRAM modules and flash modules and disk drives. So step one in the InfiniBox kind of operating system is make every workload, whether it's a large VMware environment that's already inherently very parallelized, or even if it's a single threaded, single stream, a backup job being ingested or, uh, or emitted, to make everything below the level of our port driver massively parallel. The second step is to recognize that the fastest storage media that's commercially available and viable right now is RAM. In fact, if we could, the easiest way to deliver InfiniBox performance would be to sell customers a, a, a petabyte to eight petabytes of RAM. In fact, the systems would be a lot simpler and the, there would be less mathematics involved if we could just give customers a petabyte of RAM. Well, there's only two problems with that. I can think of one. What's the... What are, well, it's not. It's volatile and it costs an infinite amount of money. Yes. All right. So I was thinking of the second one. The cost is prohibitive to, uh, to well, sell... Well, especially when you have to build the huge battery so you can dump that petabyte of RAM into flash when and the, the power fails. You're right. The volatility is, uh, is also a, uh, is probably a deal breaker for those, or it would require some extensive engineering. So, but that's the first kind of path toward down the solution. If we could theoretically come up with a way that we could service most of a multi-petabyte scale data set out of a relatively modest amount of RAM, forget about microsecond latency, forget about NVMe, we're talking about nanosecond access times at the media level. And that gives us a lot of headroom, even when we add our protocol overheads and all of our internal processing. Forget about 3D crosspoint, forget about NVMe. This is, gives us, if hypothetically you can serve most of your workload out of RAM, you have an enormous amount of runway in terms of head start uh, of staying on top of the performance race of being able to make applications increasingly faster and faster. But again, there's a huge economic problem that RAM is way, way too expensive to do it at scale. So that kind of brings us down to the lower levels of our integrated memory hierarchy. So our average InfiniBox system in terms of capacity that ships is a little bit under two petabytes of capacity. And those systems have on the order of two to two and a half terabytes of DRAM. And that's what we use for serving, for storing the working set and for serving hot data. Sitting below that is between 20 and 200 terabytes of NAND flash. This is the layer that we use for storing warm data. We never, or our goal is to never serve an IO directly out of flash because the latency on the flash layer is too high. It's a 100 to 1,000 X higher latency than serving it out of RAM. But it's a good place to store warm data. It's, a, it's an excellent, media to use as a spillover cache. And then finally, at the bottom of our memory hierarchy is we have petabytes and petabytes of nearline high capacity spinning disk. And this is what we use for storing cold data. So again, what we've kind of figured out here is that number one, there is no single type of media which solves all of the requirements simultaneously. RAM gives you the performance, but it's too expensive. Flash is fast enough, but it's still too expensive. Disk is cheap, but you can't do random I.O. to it. So essentially what we've done here is we've built an integrated memory hierarchy. And I'm sure you folks will agree, this is not a particularly innovative or new idea of having a mixed media environment. In I'm so storage. glad to hear that from you. This is 30, this is a 30 year old idea. At least. I don't know, when did Sun write ZFS? <laughs> Forget about ZFS, this goes back to- uh, 3380, 3390. Yeah, hierarchical storage management and all these, all these gray beard uh, ideas. <laughs> so- Before I was wolf. born. Uh, so, <coughs> we like our shout outs. Yeah. 
So I would argue that there isn't an enormous amount of innovation here. Um, <laughs> the magic and really the focus of our intellectual property, all the patents, we have a patent wall on the other side of here, you can see some of the things, is over here. It's all about how we manage that memory hierarchy. Because if you look back historically on kind of what the traditional trends are for how you manage a cache, um, you have things like, they used to call it HSM, and they called it tiering, and all these. Uh, you left out ILM. ILM. Um, uh, by the way, I want to know who the job is for these people who just sit and come up with acronyms and names. I want to meet the Vice President of Marketing. I want to meet the composable the infrastructure person. We can set it up if you want, Brian. <laughs> bring me to the compostable infrastructure. Well, yeah, that's know. the problem with composable infrastructure is you always read it compostable. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is kind of where our, uh, where the heart of our product, it's where all of our uh, intelligence lays. So I want to unpack this a little bit and talk about how this works. So. Uh, I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt who said, behind every great product is a great data structure. No, I don't think Not so. Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, somebody said that. Um, so there is, a, there is a special data structure. Dijkstra. Which, which lives at the heart of Infinibox. Um, and it's what we call an MVL tri, a multi-value leaf tri, or radix tree. And it's a unique, or it's a special type of order tree data structure that allows us to very efficiently store the relationships between pieces of data, between the, um, what ends up being the leafs in the tree. So the way this actually becomes implemented in our system is that every single Infinibox system in the field maintains a memory of every write that has ever been written to the system. A timestamp, so there's a spatial, there's a temporal dimension to it, or uh, uh, attribute to it, and there's a spatial element, which is the, the actual block in Just the block writes. store. Well, writes are the only interesting, I mean, writes are how the system fills up. We're starting with writes. Yeah. Um, it's used for reads, but it's populated with writes. Okay. So the, the, the purpose, of the, the main job, the day job of the tri is to act basically like any other storage system that has a, a, la a layer of virtualization, which is to provide a lookup table, which allows you to go from virtual addresses to physical addresses. But most storage systems implement these as hash tables, or you know some types of you know two dimensional arrays where you basically just give it a logical address and it tells you the physical address. It gives you a pointer to go get the data. The challenge with those is even though those are simple data structures to implement, is that in that it's purely utility function, and you can't use that table to learn anything about the relationships that exist inside of your data. And the value of and the magic of our tri data structure is the tri allows us to see the relationships between data sections in multiple dimensions. So to unpack this further, I am going to reuse one slide from Tech Field Day uh, 8 from 2015. Oh, we'll get nostalgic. <laughs> so you keep this try data for every write ever. Ever, yes. Which is nice because you can build heat maps and all sorts of things like that from it. Only for the write but, activity. Right. But don't you have size problems eventually? You mean about the size of the data structure itself? Yeah. Yeah, so that's you're, the... You're keeping, you know, 27,000 overwrites uh, so uh, if a block is overwritten and the reference count is zero, so there's nothing else pointing to it, it will eventually be replaced and that uh, data will be... Okay, injected. so it's not actually ever. It's not a log rate that is infinite. 
Oh, you're you, right. Yes, yes, that that is absolutely right. It is, it is a memory of all data that has been written and exists uniquely at this moment in and time. And ex exists uniquely at this moment in time. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, essentially, what we're doing is here do is, is we're talking about building a next generation cash manager. So the way our system works is we have our disk drives for storing cold data. And then we have the NAND flash and the DRAM, which is a transparent cache that sits in front of the cold data store. And we use a four kilobyte slot size inside the cache, both for the SSDs and in DRAM. What was that? So if you do the math out on our biggest systems, we have around 52 billion slots inside of our cache spread across the DRAM and the NAND flash. So what that means is that in any point in time, we can make 52 billion bets about what we think a future I.O. is going to be, a read. So uh, this is where reads come into, the, uh, come into the equation, Ray. We can make 52 billion bets in a row, or at a time, about what we think a future I.O. is likely to be. And the way we make that bet is we make sure that we have a copy of that either in DRAM or in Flash. And so when a write comes into one of our systems, we have a, a write mirroring process. It's going to go to one of our controller nodes. We're going to do an, uh, a DMA over our InfiniBand network. We're going to put it in two places, and we're going to acknowledge that write back to the host. And that process takes 180 microseconds. But on average in the field, it is five minutes of cache residency before that write is destaged permanently to disk. And during those five minutes, and it can go down, if the system is under high amounts of cache pressure, it can be less than five minutes, but the average in the field is five minutes. So for, again, I, for, for sequential data as well as randomly uh, written data? Uh, so, sequ so it's funny, the, what, in the old days of primitive like prefetching things, what they did is they kind of divided the world into random and sequential. Random you would ignore, and then sequential you would try to read ahead when you detected a sequential read, and you would go and get that into cache, and then you'd be able to stream it back. So a funny thing happened from that you know, kind of 80s and 90s era to the present. Being dated. Go Pardon? I'm, be, I'm being dated here. Go ahead. Aren't we used to it? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> so a funny thing happened during that time is that disk bandwidth increased tremendously. So it is now actually faster, for, at least for us, when we detect a sequential read, let's say a table scan of a database, we bypass the cache. We stream it directly off of the constituent disk drives. Our volume manager reassembles that into a into the original, you know, into the data that's being accessed. And it's using memory as the assembly area. It's using DRAM as the assembly area, but it is a it's bypassing neural count <coughs> and all of these things. See, and I was thinking about the opposite direction. What's Ran the opposite random IOs are frequently reread. Sequential writes are frequently not reread. And so you could bypass the cache. Yeah, that makes sense. That's right. a side benefit, absolutely. But so on, so you're doing it on the right side too. So if I'm writing streaming video or backup stream at one meg IOs, I'm not consuming cache that's valuable for my random access <laughs> apps at the same time? No, we're going to be using a, a buffer space to assemble it, to destage it, to analyze it. Yeah. Because but, that's the main thing that but, happens. But I'm not going to get the five minute retention. No, we're going to be evicting that faster. And that's related to cache pressure and, and, yeah. and all those things. Because we, what we don't want to have is we don't want to have the cache fill up with useless sequential data that we could have just as easily streamed right off the disk drives. Well, the, I mean, the most important thing is you don't want the backup job to evict all of the random I.O. data. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what we're talking about. So this entire infrastructure, the whole neural cache system, is actually intended to tame 
what used to be called random data. And random data is kind of the, again, in the old days, they used to say there's sequential data and there's random data. But the way that we look at it is there are, there's a spectrum of, of correlation of randomness. And it's only a question of how good are your algorithms at detecting the, core, the, the relationships between those. So on one end of the spectrum, you could have uh, highly correlated data, which is data coming from real applications that have internal data structures that impart fingerprints onto the, um, onto the access patterns. Um, but then at the other end of the spectrum, you could have you know, iometer, which is just spraying random data. Um, now, thankfully, in the real world, with real world applications, when you build your algorithms correctly to detect the, the, the patterns of access data, when you mine the try, not only to perform the utility function of the lookups, but also to look at it as a graph that represents the, the, the past the past history of all the rights, it allows you to make predictions about the future. So in our architecture, there is a component that we call the sequence detector or the classifier. And his job is to look at all of the IOs that are coming in and out, to do things like Howard, what you're suggesting, which is to ignore uh, things like sequential big block things that'll just poison the cache and aren't very interesting. Or if you're getting more sophisticated, sequential writes to the transaction logs, which are very rarely rewritten, reread. Yes, yes. You usually only want something wrong. Yes, that's very badly goes wrong. wrong. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the way that the classifier works is it organizes incoming uh, writes that it's tracking into a series of internal data structures that we call activity vectors. So an AV is an ordered set of IO operations that the classifier believes has some sort of correlation. So typically, when it's done correctly, the IOs are part of a transaction, or they're all part of a, uh, a record, or they're part of a particular walk through a, um, through a through the uh, tree. an application's data structure, something like that. And the, the sequence detector is going to classify or attempt to classify heuristically all the IOs that it's looking at. And critically, and this is where the try comes into play, if you start and you're only looking at pending IOs, so you're only looking at that you know, 100 to 200 microseconds that you have before you uh, send a write back, or let's say under a millisecond that you have for a read, the signals are relatively weak. But if you include the rolling history and you go back in time, the signals become incredibly strong. And when you take a real world workload and you run it through this system, you see the activity vectors light up like a Christmas tree. Proving that, that mathematical point that Randomness in real world infrastructure is way less common than it, than it seems. But you have to be asking the right questions from the data, you have to be looking for the right signals, and you have to have a system that's good at doing it. So the end result of this, the reason why this exists, is to look beyond the pending, the present, and to point into the future and to make predictions about future IOs or future LBAs that are likely to be accessed in the very near future because of all of the information in totality that we have about the past. And again, if you kind of start at the tip of the vector and again you look at all the potential IOs, so you start somewhere in the MVL try, you now see a graph of all the potential future IOs. And our algorithm makes a very fast calculation about the data sections that have elevated probability of being accessed. The ones with the highest probability go into the slots in DRAM. The ones with moderately elevated probability go into flash. And the ones with the lowest or no 
uh, output from the, uh, from the analysis are left alone and they're left on disk. So what's the percentage of success for your algorithm? Oh, great question. So how about I show you an example one? So um, let me show you, explain exactly what you're looking at here, and then we'll talk about the, the field as a whole. Do you guys know what a read cache hit ratio right, yeah. table looks like? This isn't anything new. The green represents reads that are serviced from DRAM. The blues represent cache misses that go to flash. So for the greens, we're serving at RAM, DRAM, nanosecond, whatever. For the blues, we're no faster than an all flash array. Um, so here's where this gets interesting. This system is a petabyte and a half data set. It has a terabyte and a half of DRAM, so the RAM is a tiny little thing at the top of the memory hierarchy. This particular system is owned by a e-commerce company. They're not a public reference, so I don't want to say their name, but they're a household name. If you don't know them, your spouse probably shops there. It's damp um, there, right? Hmm? It's damp there, right? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, but they, uh, they basically run their entire company. They run their production e-commerce site on this, their ERP, their like Oracle financials, everything is, is on this. Check out the dates. This is Black Friday weekend. This is the busiest shopping day of the year. And this company is basically running their entire IT operation out of a terabyte and a half of RAM. And 4% of their IOs on the 29th got processed from spinning disks? Uh, yeah, so disks, these disks, disks. Uh, drops are backup jobs kicking mm -hmm. off because we do the cache <laughs> bypass and we actually count them as cache misses okay. when we go to disk. But my point is, the reason why I, I put I this wouldn't up, kill you if you excluded those from cache misses. <laughs> yeah. If you knew it so, was a backup. So, yeah. listen, guys, the, we're, we're, the performance of Infinivox is so ridiculously better than any commercially available storage system because we're serving out of the vast majority of IOs out of RAM that we do things for, just for fun. Like, when we talk about latency, the latencies that we report is round-trip latency that includes the sand fabric. Nobody else does that just by what they call latency is the internal from the from the driver. Um, Those other people are evil. No, they're not. Latency, they're not. Latency is, the only latency that matters is application scene latency. Uh, yeah. You're a network, you have a network background, don't you? Mm -hmm. Hold it. No. Yeah. Um, <coughs> you're right, you're right. But also, I just want to be very clear, I'm not singling out any, I, I disagree that it's evil. I think that it's just the way that other vendors do it. We have such a ridiculous performance advantage that we can do things like that, and then customers are delighted when they find out that we are. Um, uh, so is it typical for your customer base to see a read hit rate of 99% on, so on the big the, application? Well, yeah, so the average in the field is around 90% DRAM hits. Read the hit. average in the field for reads. So 100% of writes. There's no way to do a write to an Infinibox other than to DRAM. There's no thing that goes into overflow mode and anything like that. So 100% of writes, and globally, 90% of reads, within a percentage or so, the last time I checked, come out of DRAM. That's how good, this is how good we have gotten at the math behind cache management, behind the matrix calculus, the linear algebra, of looking at collections and histories and making predictions by looking at relationships and correlations. It makes a lot of sense. Have you ever tried putting the, the same formula, the same amount of RAM in front of all solid state? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you get any sort of improvement on performance? No, they're not any faster. All it's they are exactly is Exactly the same. They're just nine times more expensive. It gives us absolutely no benefit. So we're close, I mean, we work very closely. We have an amazing engineering relationship with Intel in particular. Um, we, like, we have a, a strategic relationship. We got the first uh, commercially shipping Optane chips, we believe, in the world. So at least that's what their, their biz dev person told us. <laughs> um, so they look at Infinibox as a test bed for crazy new, you know, futuristic storage stuff. It's just because um, they know you. Right. Um, and also they're 
office in Israel is close to ours, so convenience <laughs> <laughs> factor. But we work very closely with the Flash people, and I want to be very clear that like we're not anti-Flash, but we believe very strongly that there's correct tools for different types of jobs, and um, frankly, we find the idea of storing all of your data, including your cold data, on the most expensive media that money can buy, persistent media, is kind of preposterous. Or at least profitable. It's preposterous. Yeah, maybe. Mm. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it makes perfect sense. And again, going back to conventional wisdom, if your data set is small enough, if you're talking about something that's between 10 and 100 terabytes of storage, keep it simple. Put the whole thing on media that's fast enough and, and just be done with it. But once your problem changes by orders of magnitude, and once you start having multi-petabyte problems, you would be laughed out of any engineering meeting if you proposed to build your entire storage system out of flash. And again, these concepts, these ideas of building a hybrid memory hierarchy like this are not new. The roots of it go back to the mainframe era. The most recent practical examples were the hyperscalers in Silicon Valley figured this out a decade ago but they did it for very specific use cases. They did it for object storage, for big systems for storing large amounts of photos of people's cats and their food, and eventually video. And the, you know, an interesting way of thinking about our innovation is how to take those kind of hyperscaler tech stacks to scale them down into appliances that are self-managing and to make them so that they're able to handle the types of workloads that enterprise customers care about. And object storage is not a very useful, uh, um, is not a singularly useful um, architecture for the types of problems that we're solving uh, for the next so, so what happens when your cache layer is oversubscribed? Over you have cache overflow. Cache pressure. Yeah, so the cache is all of the slots. Once a system has been running for any reasonable amount of time. Every slot is full, so we always have 52 billion. Again, it depends on the amount of cache that you have. That's but every slot is always full. Every CPU is always pegged, because all the spare CPU is always used by neural cache for making these calculations for analysis <laughs> and predictions. But as a system starts to get overrun, what you would see is the cache hit ratio starts to go down. And we have infrastructure in our uh, support Knox, where, among other things, we are looking at the hit ratios for every storage system that's out there deployed for all three and a half exabytes. And so we use predictive analytics to tell us when a, any system that we look at is forecasted to run out of either capacity or out of I bandwidth or IOPS overhead. And we're going to be on top of that, and we're going to have a solution for that customer, bef ideally before that would ever well, become how, a problem. But the way that you see it is uh, the, the hit ratio goes when down. You, so typically when a storage solution is oversubscribed, it breaks very quickly. So are you saying that your operations are coming back with some sort of solution? How does that... Yeah, so the, the most common solution... Well, almost real time? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. So what I'm saying is that... Um, if a particular customer has, let's say they put, again, we have, uh, there's a role in our company called a technical advisor. So the TA is a person who works for the customer, but we pay their salary. And it's included for free in our um, basic you know, support, which is also no additional charge. As long as you have an active ma maintenance contract, every customer has a TA. And the TA is responsible for all aspects of the customer's happiness and care after the sale is done. And this is a, um, a model that other storage companies in the 80s and 90s kind of figured out that the Resident way that you, engineer. The way that you take the, you make enterprise customers and happy is you have to be there. You have to show up. And maybe some days you're just making coffee and helping with, you know, with some sort of planning exercise. But if something goes wrong, like you move a workload and you have a, now have a new you know, bandwidth limitation or something like that, the TA is kind of the universal point of contact for dealing with that. But also providing uh, pro, proactive uh, activity like uh, monitoring uh, 
the system and uh, by possible uh, performance. So that's all handled remotely. That's our support center that does that, and our support cloud automates most of that analysis. But it is a remote team that's watching. That's the eye in the sky that's watching over the three and a half exabytes of deployments. And if there's anything that's component that's misbehaving or anything that could potentially lead to a service degradation or, God forbid, a, an application outage. Yeah, but sometimes maybe something is changing uh, at the customer because, uh, for example, they are adding new ESX uh, nodes. Uh, so the right. workload uh, are changing uh, in the number. So Right. Periodically check uh, the environment uh, or? Yeah, so it's, it's theoretically possible that a customer could increase their workload by 10x. Uh, and then the system, the, the model that they have would theoretically be unable to support that. Yeah. The cache would start getting overrun. It's absolutely theoretically possible. But we have such a high touch relationship with customers. So at this point, I think, Doc, Basically, every system that we ship includes a performance guarantee. Mm. So we do application modeling. We have an automated system. We give a script to a customer. We pull data off of their existing storage arrays. We use that historical performance data to construct a synthetic workload, which if they give us the configuration of that system, we can create a synthetic workload that will generate those IOPS bandwidth and latency from and kind of impute what the workload is. And then we then use that synthetic workload running against our various models to make a recommendation to the customer which to buy and then to write a performance guarantee. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is the combination of the ridiculous amount of headroom that these systems have compared to our competitor systems, plus the very high touch uh, go to market model, we rarely get surprised. If we do, and we get it to a situation where the cache is getting overrun or something like that, almost certainly the solution is we add more SSD. We increase the size of the flash cache. And then the system can support a higher, larger working set, and the, and the problem goes away. And that does happen once in a while. So, so the resolution to, to your cache efficiency dropping <coughs> is to add more solid state to yeah. the cache. Fine. Makes a lot of sense. Is there any magic behind the configuration of the spinning disk? Is it a standard sort of RAID 6 architecture? Oh, yeah, great question. Yeah. No, so it's actually uh, it's, it's, it's pretty innovative. So here's the way the process works. Like I said, on average, five minutes after uh, a write comes into our cache, it becomes a candidate, candidate to get destaged. So what we do is we have a component uh, on the, in the back end of our arch architecture, which is called the allocator. And the allocator's job is to pick data sections out of memory. And again, a data section is 64 kilobytes of data plus a 4 kilobyte metadata area, which mm -hmm. includes a timestamp, uh, some information that we use for prefetching hints, and uh, a checksum. Mm -hmm. So when it's getting ready to go on disk, it becomes a 68 kilobyte piece of data. So what the allocator does is the allocator thread chooses 14 data sections at a time. Out of taking those 14, he computes two additional parity sections. So the stripe size becomes 16 times 68 kilobytes. And at the moment of D stage, those 16 uh, uh, data sections are compressed and then written to 16 out of the 480 disk drives on the back end of the system. So it's written. Each one of these sections is written once, or all 16 sections are written 16 times? Uh, each section is written once, but they're written as part of a transaction. Because uh, the way our, it's a, it's a double parity RAID mechanism. So if we have any 14 out of the 16, we can reconstruct the entire message. So okay. um, those 16 data sections are uh, Created basically at the same time, and they're written each to you know each one of them is written to one out of the 480 backend disk drives okay. for a total of 16 IOs. Uh, but it's a little more complicated than that because we also write multiple uh, 
multiple um, uh, it's a vertical error correcting of the, of the bed of time because we want to do the largest possible IOs to the disk drives to maximize. A um, log structured file in the back? Yes, and it's strictly a log structured write. So both for the disk drives and for the flash media, we only do sequential writes. So we fill out, fill them up sequentially. The SSDs are basically a circular buffer and the, the uh, um, the disk drives, obviously, or the data has to be retained. And, isn't and you're, you're still going to try to maintain the, the topmost efficiency. So if, if your cache is being chewed up, the rest of the system isn't going to be working to push data down to slower spinning disk. It's going to do its best to keep up with other functions that it needs. I, I no, so it's, it's actually doing the opposite. Um, so the best analogy, uh, and again, getting back to the try and the prefetching, is imagine a bundle of grapes sitting on a table. And if you literally pick up one of the grapes and you take it with your, grasp it with your fingers and you lift it, you're going to see all these other grapes that kind of come up with it. That's literally or not literally, that is by way of analogy, reaching to a particular point in the try mm -hmm. and pulling the things that you're getting are the pieces of data that have strong statistical correlations with the, uh, with the one you're taking. Okay. So when we're under a condition where, let's say the system's starting to get you know, banged up and the, you know, maybe the latency is going up, neural cache is gonna go into overdrive and it's gonna start being more aggressive with prefetching, and it's going to focus on those cache misses, which we analyze very carefully. Anytime we have a double cache miss, and we have to go all the way to disk to get the data, now the analysis is focused on what did we miss in that signal? And then, again, from that point in the try of pulling out that try. That neural cache problem. is actually RAM. It's not solid state, right? It's uh, all of it. So it's a, it's, an algorithm that runs on the CPUs, mm -hmm. and it's a data structure that lives in memory right. and is replicated uh, across all the nodes on the system. In fact, maybe an easy way to uh, uh, bring this back to reality is if you open up the box, this is literally what's inside. It's three batteries, three Linux boxes, and eight JBODs. We have literally the most boring hardware that has ever existed. Non volatile and RAM? No, it's standard dynamic RAM. Yeah, so we also have three what we call automatic transfer switches. So they're uh, triple pole, double throw latching relays. And their job is in the event of a single bus power failure That's in the data center to keep everything here energized. But the, in the event of a full emergency power off in the data center, where both the incoming power legs are uh, de energized, the battery backup units and their 1U UPS modules. Yeah, we were in there. Their job is to keep the servers powered up, powered up long enough so that we can destage the dirty write cache and then do an orderly shut shut. Down. <clears throat> and it's in Finiband inside the cabinet. Correct. Uh, yeah. So we use 56 gigabit FDR um, for communication between the nodes. Mm -hmm. We use. SAS for communication between the servers to the JBODs, and InfiniBand and iSCSI and NFS for communication out to the world. The JBODs strictly uh, hold disk drives. All of the caching, the DRAM and the NAND flash is all stored on the servers. And that's it. It's a, uh, like I said, it's pretty much the most boring unsexy hardware that you could possibly imagine. But the thing that, you know... It does the job, you know? Yeah, the thing that I hope you all appreciate is the density and the amount of storage capacity that we get out of such a tiny amount of hardware. Again, conservatively, we say from a marketing perspective, 8.4 petabytes for our large flagship systems, but we have plenty of those systems that have over 10 petabytes because they're getting good compression. And I would put that storage capacity with this amount of hardware up against any uh, storage architecture that's, you know, that's, that's going on right now. 
And again, when you make things efficient, you can make them lower cost. When you make things lower cost, you make new types of use cases possible. And actually, that's actually a perfect place for me to end the presentation and get ready to hand things over to Eric. Um, I've been talking about our stuff for, you know, for, for, for too long, so it's, it's time to go back to a customer story. And I think, Doc, I think you alluded to these guys in your discussion. So Sprint is an amazing customer of ours. And they run most of their company on our storage technology, um, like for their core infrastructure and, and stuff like that. But they recently embarked on an incredibly ambitious analytics project. And their vision was to create a single analytics platform which could be used by every business line in the company. So the vision was, again, one analytics tool, one platform that could be used by the IT people to, analog, to analyze like syslogs and stuff coming off the routers, to look at API response times on the website, and correlate all that stuff together. But could also be used by their operations teams to look at foot traffic in the stores and correlate that with, uh, with sales and profitability and all the types of interesting business questions that operations people are interested in. It was an incredibly uh, ambitious analytics project. And it ended up being a huge success. They used the uh, ELK, uh, basically open source Splunk, as the, as the tech stack for it. And uh, we were delighted to see, without even getting advanced notification, you can go to this URL right here, and you can watch the Sprint project leader go tell this story of how they did it. And at the end of the day, one of the <laughs> fundamental things that made it possible is somebody in IT went and connected the architect who was building this and said, forget about the SDS and the, all the all flash nonsense that you're trying to build the system. You're, the data sets are too large. You're, there is a reason why your business case isn't working. And that reason is that you're using conventional wisdom to go solve a nonlinear, uh, multi-petabyte, unconventional problem. And uh, Infinidat, our little, little guy in the corner, came into the equation. And now they have uh, a huge success. And they're an amazing uh, reference now. So uh, this is a good point for me to stop. I'm going to hand things over to Eric. The next kind of the rest of this presentation is we're going to move away from the kind of first era of Infinidat, which was how do we build what we believe is the world's best storage array, into the kind of modern era of Infinidat, which is how do we help customers go build the world's best storage clouds.